to a now order of show in East San Diego, California. Last word out of your mouth from here on out be served. Do you understand that? Yes, yes sir. sir! I think so, you understand that? Yes, yes sir! sir. I tell you to get off this bus. You're going to get off this bus without even running, pushing, or shoving. Get on my yellow footprints from front to rear, right to left. Do you understand that? Yes, yes sir! Get off the bus right now. Go, 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 tighten it up. Tighten Historian Henry Brooks Adams once said, they know enough who know how to learn. These Marine Corps recruits are counting on the truth in that statement to get them through the toughest three months of their lives. They must learn how to survive in a harsh new environment in which the smallest details of their behavior are scrutinized. They will have to change lifelong habits and learn new skills. In the Marine Corps, as in life, an individual's ability to learn can make the difference between success and failure. But how do we learn? What is involved in the learning process? Humans are born helpless. But dependence on others to provide for our basic needs doesn't last long. Perhaps because we come equipped to learn. But what is learning? The common answer is the acquisition of knowledge. To psychologists, however, learning has a much broader meaning. Psychologists find learning as a relatively permanent change in behavior, behavior or mental processes due to experience. And what really the essence of this topic is are those last three words due to experience because different experiences, different patterns of experiences lead to changes in behavior or mental processes. Whether it's a child wrestling with a spoon for the first time or a recruit in basic training, learning is crucial to the survival of our species. It is learning that enables us to adapt to our ever-changing environment. As we learn, we develop behaviors that help us to operate more effectively in our surroundings. And hopefully, we also learn to eliminate behaviors that hold us back. While some of the learning we do is intentional, such as taking on a new skill, much of it is not. When my daughter was less than a year old, with, with infants, of course, you have a whole series of vaccinations you have to do. And the very first time that we went in for the um, for routine vaccination, everything was hunky-dory with, with our daughter, right up until the time that uh, Paula, the nurse, who was wearing a white uniform, gave her, the, uh, gave her the, the vaccination. Now, Laura just, you know, screamed bloody murder. I mean, it hurt, it scared her, everything else, and she was, you know, trying to get away. Three months later, we had to go back for another vaccination, and my daughter did fine. We, we went to uh, the pediatrician's office, and we were in the examining room, and she was just happy, you know, happy as clam, and until, of course, Paula, the nurse, came in wearing this white uniform, and Laura screamed bloody murder. Now, Laura had become conditioned. She had associated this white uniform, okay, with, with getting the, 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 the pain of the injection, the vaccination. What happened with little Laura is an example of classical conditioning one of the most basic forms of learning. It describes how certain stimuli can automatically trigger a reflexive response. Humans have many reflexes. We shiver when we are chilly. We jump at a loud noise. Our heart pounds with fear when we feel threatened. These reflexive responses are involuntary, automatically triggered by a cold draft, the loud noise, or the growling dog. But we often have reflexive responses to stimuli that wouldn't ordinarily trigger that response, such as a nurse's uniform triggering fear in a child. Classical conditioning describes how this comes about. Classical conditioning was, was uh, initially discovered and studied by Ivan Pavlov, who was a Russian physiologist. And his uh, goal in his early career was to study the digestive process. And the strategy that he adopted was to study uh, the behavioral reactions, the physiological reactions that occurred uh, as something entered the mouth. His strategy was thwarted very early on uh, when he found that uh, 
the dogs he was studying became, in his words, psychics. He would take a dog and he had food deprived it, and he'd put it on a little stand. And what he'd do is he'd blow some meat powder into the dog's mouth and study the salivary reflex. And after a couple of days of this procedure, he found that the dog, would, when he entered the stand, would begin salivating in anticipation of being fed. <clears throat> and at that point, his experiment was ruined because he couldn't study the reaction to the food. The dog was salivating as a psychic, predicting that he was going to get food. After some initial frustration, Pavlov soon realized the importance of the connection he had observed. His very presence seemed to trigger an automatic response in the dogs, the salivary reflex. Pavlov wondered if the conditioning he had observed could be repeated with another seemingly unrelated stimulus. The story goes that uh, Pavlov's laboratory uh, actually lived above his laboratory. At that point, he ran upstairs and stole a metronome off of his wife's piano and brought it down into the laboratory. And as an experiment, what he'd do is he'd turn this metronome on for a minute or two, and then he'd deliver the food to the dog's mouth. And after several pairings of this metronome, which didn't elicit any salivation, wasn't a food object for the dog, um, pairings of that with the delivery of food to the animal, the dog began salivating to the metronome. Before the dogs were conditioned, the unconditioned stimulus of food triggered an unconditioned response, that is, the salivary reflex. In other words, Pavlov's dogs did not have to learn to salivate when food was placed in their mouths. And under normal circumstances, they wouldn't salivate at all to the sound of a metronome. The metronome is a neutral stimulus. But when the neutral stimulus, the metronome, was repeatedly paired with the unconditioned stimulus, the food, the dogs began to salivate at the sound of the metronome alone. This neutral stimulus became a conditioned stimulus and the salivary reflex became a conditioned response. There are many examples of classical conditioning in humans. One of the earliest experiments was conducted by psychologist John Watson, who conditioned a baby to fear a white rat by pairing the rat with a loud noise. Eventually, little Albert came to fear other furry white objects, including rabbits, cotton, and even Watson wearing a Santa Claus beard. You are now members of Platoon 1093, Series 1093, Company B, 1st Recruit Training Battalion. I will now introduce to you the drill instructors responsible to me for your training. Senior drill instructor, take charge of these recruits and train them to become United States Marines. Aye, right, sir. Again, my name is Gunnery Sergeant McWilliams, and I am your senior drill instructor. I am assisted in my duties by Drill Instructor Staff Sergeant Via and Drill Instructor Staff Sergeant Matt. Our mission is to train each one of you to become a United States Marine. A Marine is Classical conditioning is a key strategy in turning raw recruits into Marines. The purpose of recruit training is not to train a Marine for combat, but, but to train them to be a basically trained Marine. If I, I am breaking down a misconception, where a Marine will be trained for further on for combat is when he leaves here and he goes on to specialized schools. What we're doing, though, here is preparing him for the discipline that he's going to confront at these specialized schools. How do we work the discipline in? One, instant and willing obedience to orders. How are we going to do that? The first step in moving a group of independent-minded teenagers toward instant and willing obedience to orders is to trigger the reflexive response of fear. Always be at the position of attention, you understand me? Yes, sir! Go away! Go away! Do you understand me? Yes, sir! Don't always be at the position of attention! Position of attention! Most people reflexively respond to yelling with fear. So the drill instructors yell at the recruits. In this case, yelling is an unconditioned stimulus that elicits the unconditioned reflex of fear. Yes, sir! Okay, aye, sir! Aye, sir! Aye, sir! Aye, sir! Let me tell you something right now. Who is going to take you seriously if you don't talk with some conviction? No, no, shut up. I didn't ask for an answer. First, he's going to use a voice. Now, some of the way we get our responses, recruits don't like the shouting voice. This yelling is paired with the neutral stimulus of the drill instructor's hat, the distinctive campaign cover. We call it cover identification. For us, it's a visual 
identification that they're going to sit there and focus on because they know this cover represents the Marine drill instructor. Soon, the cover alone triggers a fear response, whether or not the drill instructor is yelling. The neutral stimulus has become a conditioned stimulus, and the unconditioned reflex of fear is now a conditioned response. The recruits know that this represents a drill instructor. If I take this off, they might see me in a different light for a chance. When I put it back on, the recruits will respond and turn differently to me. During the three decades Pavlov studied classical conditioning, he noticed two important variations called stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination. Stimulus generalization is where you respond not only to the original condition stimulus, but other similar condition stimuli. So the way Pavlov did this with dogs, he could condition a dog to, uh, to salivate to a tone and then he could condition the dog to salivate to a higher pitch tone or a lower pitch tone, and the dog would salivate regardless of whether the tone was high pitched or low pitched. Little Albert is a perfect example of stimulus generalization. While he was conditioned to fear a white rat, his fear response generalized to include other white furry things. Remember, even Santa's beard triggered this response. Stimulus discrimination is basically just the opposite, where you respond uh, to the original condition stimulus, but not other similar condition stimuli. So if we stay with the same example, Pavlov could condition the dog to salivate only to, we'll say, a medium pitch tone, but not to a high pitched or a low pitch tone. The dog is discriminating between those similar stimuli. Another example of stimulus discrimination would be if a Marine encountered a national park ranger who wears a hat similar to his drill instructor. Would he respond with the same fear? Probably not. The Marine would make a distinction between the two hats and the persons wearing them and respond appropriately. He is able to discriminate between the two stimuli. As we've seen, classical conditioning explains how we learn involuntary reflexive responses to stimuli that wouldn't ordinarily trigger that response. You're moving too slow. Fix my rock, sir. But what about voluntary behavior, like marching or making a bed? How do we learn those? Now, we all remember where our head was, right? Yes, sir. Now, utilizing the body system, you got dug on three minutes. Exactly three minutes to make the bottom right. You understand me? Yes, sir. No, wait. You understand me? Yes, sir. No, ah, uh, no. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Go in the move. Edward L. Thorndike was the first psychologist to systematically investigate how we learn new voluntary behaviors. Later, American psychologist B.F. Skinner became famous for defining the principles of this important form of learning. Skinner coined the term operant to describe behaviors that operate upon the environment and generate consequences. I would define opera conditioning as shaping and maintaining behavior by making sure that reinforcing consequences follow. So let me give you an example. Suppose we have a pigeon here, an ordinary pigeon, but uh, it's uh, quite peacefully walking around in a small space. We watch it and notice what it's doing. Then we decide to condition uh, some bit of its behavior. Suppose we take turning to the left a little bit. Uh, the pigeon is hungry, and we can give it a bit of food as what we call a reinforcer. It's a reinforcing consequence. We wait until it turns to the left, and then immediately give it a bit of food. Almost at once we can see that it's turning to the left more rapidly than it did before or more often. Reinforcement makes it more likely that we will repeat a behavior. Often, we're not even aware that this learning is taking place. There's a story about a professor who had criticized me publicly on, on television, and his students decided to shape his behavior. And so they agreed in advance that they would not smile or nod unless he was standing on one corner of this platform. And very soon, he spent the time standing there. And then they arranged that 
uh, he, they would not smile or nod unless he was for, facing the blackboard. And they told me that at the end of the hour, he was lecturing, facing the blackboard and talking over his shoulder. There are two types of reinforcement. Positive reinforcement makes it more likely that we will repeat a behavior because we want more of the reinforcer. For example, even though the professor wasn't aware of how his behavior was being shaped, he adjusted his position in response to the student's smiles and nods. On the other hand, negative reinforcement makes it more likely we will repeat a behavior because we want to avoid a consequence. For instance, we are likely to repeat the behavior of paying our bills on time because we want to avoid the consequence of a late charge. Likewise, we are likely to repeat the behavior of taking vitamin C because we want to avoid the consequence of getting a cold. Yes, go! No, I won't! Play, sir! I won't! Play, sir! I won't! Play, sir! I won't! Play, sir! Play, sir! Play, sir! Both positive and negative reinforcement can be found in the Marine Corps basic training program. But the one the most people associate with boot camp is negative reinforcement. The recruits learn from the drill instructors just how effective this type of conditioning can be. We believe in setting up recruits for success. Before we make them do anything, we explain it to them. And we explain it to them in detail. First sheet, you're going to lay on your right, you understand me? Yes, sir! You're going to lay at the bottom of your feet, even with my mattress, to your step. Yes, yes, sir! No way, do you understand Yes, sir! Now, one, they may not understand the detail because it's coming out a little bit louder, and they're a little bit intimidated at first. But first, they have to realize that, one, if they do listen to the drill instructor and they get the desired response, the drill instructor, one, will probably won't yell as much the next time. Within a limited amount of time, recruits are expected to learn a long list of behaviors. The significant vocal abilities of the drill instructors act as negative reinforcement to get the job done. Do the job right, and they avoid being yelled at. Negative reinforcement in action. Every moment of the day of a recruit's life is planned out from the moment when he wakes up at 5.30 in the morning till he goes to bed at 21.30. Every second is planned. So there, there's no time for any error. There's no time for any guesswork. There's no time for someone to go, okay, what am I doing now? Um, our standards have been uh, passed down. Um, they're tried, true, and they're tested. So for example, up at 5.30 in the morning, he knows that at, at, when he has to get up, he's gonna get up, stretch, uh, brush his teeth, you know, get to go into the bathroom. From there, he's gonna go on to eat his first meal of the day. He knows he has to make sure that the area is cleaned up and cleaned up correctly. We make Mothers of America proud when our recruits come back home. He knows how to make a bed probably for the first time. A lot of mothers marvel when, they, when their son comes back and says, you know, he made his bed for the first time and all I had to do was turn the lights on. And after that, then he's going to probably go into some physical fitness. And again, too, as I mentioned before about our physical fitness, that is planned and standardized. And from there, he might be exposed to a series of classes, academic-type classes, or he might be on the parade deck working drill. Um, and this would go through most of the day. Towards the end of the day, it's a time when the, the, the senior drill instructor is going to get to work with his recruits. And then again, too, before they go to bed that night, again, it's standardized. He's going to have to know how to get into the shower, that we you know, expect him to shave, uh, prepare his body, prepare his uniform, to the point that he's going to shine his shoes. And we want that all laid out, and he's going to be inspected. His body's going to be inspected. His hygiene's going to be inspected. We want to make sure that he's going to present himself in the best image possible the next day. Another important component of operant conditioning is called discriminative stimulus. This is an environmental cue or signal that sets the stage for a behavior to occur. For example, we wouldn't answer a telephone unless it were ringing. Why not? because there would be no one there. We would not be reinforced for answering it. The ringing is a cue, a discriminative stimulus. When we hear ringing, we are likely to pick up the phone because someone will be there. In other words, because we will be positively reinforced for doing so. We discriminate between the stimuli of a ringing and non-ringing phone. 
Likewise, an 18-year-old male is unlikely to make a bed so quickly for his mother. The presence of the marine drill instructor is a discriminative stimulus that cues the different behavior. You're moving entirely too slow. Why are you... Stop moving right now. You better get your head now straight to the front. Why are you moving so goddamn slow? You better stop moving the whole lot faster. You understand me? Yes, sir! The, the role of the drill instructor is almost preordained before they get to recruit training, because they, they, they know that the drill instructor is, one, a disciplinarian. Our recruiters, you know, the job they do to prepare a recruit before he comes to recruit training, sits there and says, hey, you know, you're not going to summer boy scout camp. You're going to be meeting the infamous marine drill instructor. By the same token, recruits quickly learn they can relax a little around the senior drill instructor. The different discriminative stimulus leads to a different behavior. Now, the hierarchy of, of how drill instructors work is they're going to have someone that's a senior drill instructor. And he's filling the, the all-encompassing role of, one, he's in charge of the recruits, and he's the man responsible directly for their training. But he's also the one that, that, that's also going to represent, you know, their teacher. He's going to represent their father figure in, in, in some respects. The recruits are going to see him in the role as the senior drill instructor, this father figure, this, this, this man that I could go and talk to when I have to. Although negative reinforcement is the overwhelming choice for Marine Corps drill instructors, examples of positive reinforcement can be found, and they are often delivered by the senior drill instructor. In my senior drill instructor creed, I tell the recruits that I'm still going to be there even when they quit on themselves. I want the recruits to believe that. And, and I'm going to do it. I have to be that example. So I'm going to positive, uh, positively reinforce certain aspects of their training. If they, if they achieve a, a success, I'm going to let them know about it and congratulate them. Yes, sir. I will never fail my time. Remember that. Yes, At recruit training, we have a system of, of rewards that the recruits receive, and, and there's trophies that they could achieve if they win certain events. And it's bragging rights between other platoons. So we, we create and we foster competition here because it, it's, the recruits are learning that, how to succeed. Open your mouth. The difference between positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement is easy to recognize. However, many people confuse negative reinforcement with punishment. In fact, they produce opposite effects on behavior. Negative reinforcement makes it more likely that we will repeat a certain behavior, such as making a bed correctly so we don't get yelled at. Punishment, on the other hand, makes it less likely that we will repeat a behavior. For example, a recruit who is punished for looking away from the drill instructor is less likely to look away from him the next time. We have a system we call incentive training. And this is one of the many tools the many tools that a drill instructor has as far as meting out discipline. An example of incentive training is, say the group, the entire platoon of recruits, maybe they're just, you know, that day they're, they're not performing up to an, an achievable standard. They might be a little bit slower. They may not be sounding off loud enough to the drill instructor. At the discretion of the senior drill instructor, he'll take him over to an area and make him go through a very ritualized set of upper body exercise over a certain amount of time. And usually the recruits understand that they disappointed the senior drill instructor, and he has to sit there and take time from his day to stop this ritualized training that we're doing and waste time to met out the discipline. So recruits will feel bad. And they're like, we, we disappointed him. The end state that we hope a recruit leaves here after achieving, you know, with an incentive training is to understand that if you mess up in the Marine Corps, you're going to be disciplined, you're going to be corrected, and then you're going to be expected not to make the same mistake twice. Although punishment may decrease undesirable behaviors, it does have its drawbacks. Punishment alone does not offer long-term solutions. Once the punishment is withdrawn, undesirable behaviors often reoccur. Skinner himself considered positive reinforcement to be a vastly preferred alternative. Punishment works, but punishment can only be justified if you uh, continue to look for other ways, and they will be through the use of positive reinforcement. 
There was a Bolton II experiment in, uh, in Mexico where they used every conceivable way of finding positive reinforcement for their children rather than punishment. And their children are wonderful. I've never seen happier, more social, pleasant children in my life. They never are punished because the world is so designed that they never do anything that calls for punishment. And that is the way I think the world should be. Time and again, the principles of classical and operant conditioning have demonstrated their effectiveness and have helped us to understand how we learn. Perhaps that's why the Marines have used these techniques to train their recruits for as long as anyone can remember. Because for recruits, as for the rest of us, learning is more than the acquisition of knowledge. It is adopting new behaviors and discovering new ways of dealing with an ever-changing environment. Learning is a process that goes on from morning until night, a critical part of the human experience.